Hey everyone, happy Saturday to you and happy Bama Bug Fest on the web. We want to welcome you to our another segment of our Bama Bug Fest on the web, a virtual event dedicated to the fascinating world of insects. Uh, Bama Bug Fest on the web is a collaborative event brought to you by UA Museums, Mildred Ward Westervelt Transportation Museum, Alabama Museum of Natural History, Department of Research and Collections at UA, UA's Roger Library, and the Tuscaloosa Public Library. We are offering nine total days of bug-themed content that started on July 7th and will be ending next Saturday on July 25th. For a full schedule of events, you can visit the event website, bamabugfest.org. Now today we are talking about moths and butterflies and we are gonna jump into the segment called Butterflies are Moths, but Moths Aren't Butterflies. And we are doing that with Dr. John Friel, Friel, director of the Alabama Museum of Natural History. We're really excited about it. Moths are a um, topic that have become a very familiar uh, content area, I think for the museum. Would you agree, John? Oh, definitely, done a lot of, yeah. Yeah, a lot of moths and butterflies in the last couple of years at the museum, so. We're excited to talk about it with you, John. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Do we need um, to share your screen? Yeah, that should be all okay. ready to go, Phil. Go ahead. Excellent. And share Let me take myself out of here. Okay. All right. Well, as Allie said, the topic today is going to be moths and butterflies or lepidopterans, as uh, entomologists call, call them. They're a group that I think most people recognize, but maybe haven't understood what the relationship of butterflies and moths are, uh, whether they're one and the same. As the name implies, uh, hopefully you'll learn today that um, basically butterflies are in fact moths. And I'll give you some, some pointers to uh, how you might distinguish a different group, some things they have in common, some things that are different, and also just maybe engage you. Um, they tend to be one of the you know, for people to get interested in bugs and insects in particular, moths are a great way to do it. It's, I, I professionally study fishes, but my kind of introduction into insects really came with me just getting interested in the moths that were coming to my front porch at night that were attracted by a light. So I'll talk a little bit about things that are going on. It, it, the timing is perfect. Uh, this is the first day of National Moth Week, which I'll tell you a little bit more in detail, but it's an international celebration that encourages people to observe the moths that are in their local areas and kind of share those observations with others. And as you'll see in a bit, moths are incredibly diverse as are butterflies, and it's a great opportunity. They don't sting adult moths. As I mentioned in my last talk that some caterpillars sting. Um, adult moths and butterflies are completely harmless. So you have nothing to be afraid of um, observing them. Uh, the worst they can do is like fly into your face and, and they're just going to tickle you. They're not going to do anything else. So let me go here to the next slide. Um, if you saw any of my earlier talks, I kind of put things in perspective of how diverse they are. Uh, I mentioned early on that 80% of all animal species that are living on earth today are arthropods. And within that, insects are one portion of that. Uh, the pie chart here, what I'm gonna be talking today is the Lepidoptera, that green slice. Uh, I noticed here the number says 120,000 species. I'm gonna tell you in a moment, that's actually an underestimate. There are actually about 180 species, but that's the group we're going to focus on today, um, that particular group. And they're pretty charismatic animals. Uh, I think most people would recognize or not confuse, for example, a moth or a butterfly with the wasp, although there are some mimics uh, there, and I'll probably show you at least one of those today. But that's the group we're going to be focusing on. So Lepidoptera, which includes all moths and butterflies, their scientific name of their order it means scale wing, and this is one of the distinctive features uh, that this group shares that is not found in other groups of insects. There actually are well over 180,000 species of Lepidoptera that are described by scientists, with butterflies only make, making up maybe 18,000 of those. So that's 18,000 is a large number, but then when you realize the remaining um, over 100,000 are, in fact, moths, you realize there are many more moths than butterflies. And that's something that surprises a lot of people. Uh, people often think maybe butterflies are as common or at least as common as moths, but they really are the min uh, minority when it comes to di total diversity within the order Lepidoptera. And if you just look at North America, we have more than 700 species of butterflies, but over a thousand, 11 thousand species of moths. Again, this kind of disparity, almost 10 times as many moths as butterflies. Uh, so when you realize how diverse butterflies are and then realize that you have to 
go in order to order of magnitude larger to really appreciate the diversity must you start getting a sense for how diverse just this one group and this is just one order of insects uh, out of all the insects out of all the arthropods that are known uh, features of adult lepidopterans uh, as their name implies they're covered with these distinctive scales that cover their bodies and wings they also have typically as adults a kind of an extendable proboscis some people call, you know, sometimes think it looks like a tongue that they can protrude for feeding. And we'll talk a little bit, you know, one of the things you'll often observe butterflies doing in particular during the day is uh, they will be flitt flittering around and will land on, on a flower. And in the process, they're seeking nectar and will stick that proboscis out, roll it out, um, reach where the nectar is in the flower, feed upon it, and then roll it back in before they fly off. And in the process, they're picking up pollen. And when they go to the next flower, they'll be pollinating as well. And they also have, all Lepidoptera have a, a very common life cycle that will include complete metamorphosis. So this is a, this group as well as some other orders um, have a, a very distinctive larval phase, which in uh, Lepidoptera is, is called a caterpillar that will go through a pupil stage. And then depending on what the species is, will emerge as an adult moth or butterfly. And this metamorphosis, as it sounds, is a complete restructuring. So they break down a lot of their internal tissues develop the wings and structures that they'll have as adults all in that pupil case before they emerge. So it really is a complete um, changeover from their larval phase. And this kind of reflects the different functions of their life. The larval phase is really all about growing and gaining as much energy as you can, getting as big as you can, as quick as you can. And then that transition to an adult, they switch into, it's all about reproduction. They just want to find a mate and reproduce and for many species, sometimes they're only alive for a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks at the maximum. So there's this real contrast between the two parts of their life cycle. So let's look a little at some of the details. Here is a close-up, a magnification of the a wing of a butterfly showing you the individual scale. So each of those um, colorful structures is an individual scale. And in this particular butterfly, you're looking at a spot on a butterfly wing. So you get different colors. The colors of each scale, sometimes they're due to pigments. Sometimes they're actually due to differences in the surfaces uh, of the scales, which make refract, refract light differently. So you can actually get some colors which are not due to pigments or due solely to refraction of light. So if you've ever picked up a moth or butterfly, either alive or dead, you sometimes notice that what some people think is dust or powder that's on your fingers, that in fact are, those are in fact are scales that you've knocked loose from the body of the moth or caterpillar. And they wear off. They only, they when they emerge from their cocoon or pupa, they, they have the perfect set of these scales and then they wear off. And you can sometimes notice really old uh, moths or butterflies will have bald spots where these things rub off as they bump into structures. Uh, so these wear away and eventually, um, I've seen moths which almost completely lack these uh, that are near kind of the end of their lifespan. So this is a really typical feature that all moths and butterflies share. I mentioned the proboscis. I've got two pictures here. So on the left is a day flying hawk moth uh, that show, in this case, its proboscis is extended. And you might be amazed in many of these cases, um, the proboscis, this feeding structure, is actually longer than the body of the animal itself. In this case, the moth is flying during the day to flowers, and it's extended its proboscis, and the tip of it is actually sticking into a flower that's at the right side of that figure. And at the on the, on the right side, that picture is actually of a butterfly in which the proboscis is in its retracted position. So it's almost like a party favor that they can extend when they're feeding and retract when they're not using it. And the tip of it is always stuck into typically a flower. And depending on the flower, um, it may be stressed. So there are actually some flowers which have the nectar source very deep within the flower. And those are typically pollinated by moths or butterflies that have really long proboscises and vice versa. So this is something, and not all um, moths have this. There are a few cases where there's some moths that don't feed as adults, but the ones that do, that are trying to get a little bit of energy, uh, they're not going to grow any bigger as adults, but they do need energy to power their flight muscles while they're looking for mates. Uh, they will actively search for nectar and feed using that proboscis. Here's the life cycle. Um, so it's, it's not a very complicated life cycle, but it's kind of shown there on the left, starting as eggs that are often deposited on plants 
Uh, almost all moths and butterflies have very specific plants depending on the species. Some species will only lay eggs in a particular plant. Others are uh, kind of more flexible, and but typically there's a limited number of plants that a particular species of moth or butterfly will lay their eggs on. Uh, if you watch the earlier um, reading this morning at, uh, about the hungry butter, uh, caterpillar, the uh, Eric Carlisle book, it goes through this entire cycle. You start off as an egg and that egg hatches and a little tiny caterpillar crawls out and begins feeding. And they go through several larval stages, sometimes called instars. They're always called caterpillars or um, in, in Lepidoptera. And they, they continually grow and they really are eating machines. Uh, it's been a repeated theme. It's come, to, come up multiple times in some of our presentations, how much uh, caterpillars eat. And all the energy they're going to gain, they typically gain um, as caterpillars. And then when they've eaten enough and kind of reached a critical size, they will form a pupa, either a cocoon or a chrysalis, uh, as it's called in butterflies. And then after several weeks, uh, the caterpillar goes to a metamorphic stage inside that cocoon and emerges as the adult, uh, and the scientific name is the imago, uh, the adult moth or butterfly. It flies around for days to weeks, finds a mate, reproduces successfully, and then the female will find her host plant, lay eggs, and the entire cycle begins over again. And this cycle, depending on the species, might happen once a year, might happen multiple times a year. Uh, for example, our lunar moths, uh, this big green uh, silk moth that occurs here in Alabama, I think they have up to three different uh, broods or cycles. So there'll be the first one earlier in the spring and then two more later in the year. And then uh, I've got memes th thrown out throughout this. On the right, kind of, that's the caterpillar from the Hungry Caterpillar book. And the, the little joke here is after some poor life decisions that of becoming a beautiful butterfly, it gets distracted by a lamp and decides to become kind of a rather drab looking moth. And I mentioned caterpillars eat a lot. So I, I, I wanted to give you a real life example so you can really appreciate what that's like. So I picked out something uh, a monarch butterfly. So this is a species of butterfly um, that comes to Alabama. They migrate from North America to Central America and, and back. Um, and so at least some populations do. And they feed on milkweed, a uh, particular kind of plant. And a, a single monarch butterfly caterpillar um, will, once it's hatched, will eat 200 times its own birth weight in milkweed leaves in just only 10 to 14 days. So, and that little cycle there in the upper left-hand corner shows you those black and yellow caterpillars they have. And then as it continues clockwise, it goes into the pupil stage in a chrysalis, the metamorphosis, and then emerging as an adult um, monarch butterfly. But the equivalent, if you think about this, those of us that have kids, or if you think about you as a kid, this is equivalent to a seven pound newborn child consuming 1,400 pounds of milk or formula in just a two-week period. It's just mind-boggling. And uh, it's come up multiple times. Uh, if you go out now, it's peak caterpillar season. You can look at a lot of vegetation. You'll see where caterpillars have been feeding on them. Sometimes entire trees will be defoliated by feeding caterpillars. Um, so these things, they are just eating day and night uh, until they've got enough energy uh, to form that pupa and metamorphose into an adult moth or caterpillar. So there are even bigger caterpillars than monarchs. So I picked out something that occurs in Alabama here. This is both the largest caterpillar that you might encounter in Alabama or actually anywhere in North America, and as well as the heaviest moth. Um, it's known depending on the caterpillars are typically called the hickory horn devil. And they get up to just a little over five inches, not quite six inches in length before they pupate. And at the right is what they metamorphose in. This is the regal moth, a large uh, giant silk moth. And this is actually an individual we I photographed at uh, a, a moth fest, a precursor to Urbana Bug Fest a few years ago at Moundville Archaeological Park. So these moths are right are out and about right now. I didn't see one last night, hoping to see one this week as part of National Moth Week. Um, but I have, I have actually seen them at my house as well here in Tuscaloosa. So... Uh, caterpillars get quite big, and this is something that if you get into caterpillars uh, and moths is a real surprise. Uh, I, well, I've seen the adults multiple times in Alabama. I haven't yet seen the um, the caterpillars. It's on my wish list, so uh, keep an eye out for you. And, and although they look kind of terrifying, and it looks like this might be something that could sting you, they're actually harmless. This is a case where um, 
uh, looks like a stinging caterpillar and in fact is not one. So moving on to the question of, well, are moths really butterflies? So the first thing I have here is, is showing you a big phylogeny, which is kind of an evolutionary tree for all butterflies. And don't worry about the details. I just want to give you a sense of the diversity. So it's drawn in a circular fashion with different representative butterfly groups represented along the periphery of it. But the idea I wanted to get here is that moths are really diverse. There are, you know, hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands of species of moths around the world, uh, at least 700 species just in North America. So they're really diverse in the shapes of their wings and their colors and their relative sizes, really diverse group. But if we step back and put this in a bigger context, so the next figure I'm going to say, well, let's, where will these fit if we start including moths? Uh, which there might be 10 times or more moth species in the world than there are of butterflies. Uh, the picture train changes drastically. So here is a recent phylogeny uh, published just last year, in fact, looking at all lepidopteran diversity. And what I have in the red box is all that butterfly phylogeny squished down there. So there are basically some moths that are more closely related to butterflies than they are to other moths. So butterflies are what we call a monophyletic group. They're all descended from a common ancestor, but this ancestor is nested within the bigger group we call moths. So while moths are monophyletic, uh, moths really aren't. Um, there are some moths that are, in fact, share a more common recent ancestor with all butterflies than they do with other moths. So that's kind of the big reveal that we want to really communicate to the public is that butterflies are a real thing, but in the bigger picture, they really are also uh, technically moths. And the analogy I like to make is toads and frogs. Um, there are toads, and, and while toads are frogs, not all frogs are toads, or an equivalent might be tortoises. Um, all tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises. So it, they're just kind of a subgroup. So we have the same thing going on here with butterflies. And we like to remind people of that because butterflies get a lot of attention, uh, whereas while they are quite diverse, the real diversity is in kind of what I think are the underappreciated moths. And kind of a, you know pointing at some of these jokes here, the one meme I have here says, science fact number 75, moths are just goth butterflies. Uh, this reflecting the idea that they're kind of all drab, only nocturnal, unlike the brightly colored uh, diurnal uh, day flying butterflies. On well, the flip side of that is, what's a butterfly? Oh, it's just a pretentious, high maintenance moth. They're kind of the moth divas. So that's a kind of common way a lot of people see them, and way we can think about this. But in the big picture, butterflies really are moths. So let's look at some of the details of how you might separate if you came across a living uh, butterfly or moth, and you weren't sure what it was. What would you look at? Uh, the first clue is often the antenna. So butterflies typically have relatively elongated antenna that at the tip are club or kind of expanded, whereas moths typically have antenna that look bushy, often uh, with little uh, tufts on them. So that's, and there are exceptions to the rule, but by and large, that rule holds true. Also the structure of the body. Most butterflies are rather slender bodied compared to moths. Moths, depending on the species, some do have slender bodies, but most of them are much heavier bodied um, lepidoptins than butterflies are. Uh, the time of activity. Uh, butterflies, the vast majority of them are, are, as you suspect, only active during the day. Uh, they're flying around doing most of their activity, feeding and looking for mates and laying eggs during the day. There are a few exceptions. I, I occasionally get butterflies that come to my lights at night when I'm looking for moths and vice versa. There are moths. Uh, we have actually some, I showed you a picture earlier of a hawk moth and we do have hawk moths here that uh, fly around. There's one that they're sometimes called hummingbird moths because they can hover like hummingbirds, but you'll see them uh, buzzing around, pollinating um, flowers this time of year locally. So that's another difference between them. The resting posture. Most butterflies, when they're resting, rest with their wings folded. So they're kind of up, touching each other against their back, whereas uh, moths typically rest with their wings kind of down. So if I just go backwards here, like the picture there of the goth butterfly with the moth with the wings to the side, that's a very typical uh, moth uh, wing posture. And butterflies typically, in the case of the butterfly, have them folded up sometimes completely together, so you only see the ventral surface of the wings. 
Uh, something else, coloration in general, again, not always 100% accurate. Butterflies in general are more colorful, but I'll show you lots of colorful uh, moths in a second. And then finally, the pupal stage. If you came across a pupa, typically moth pupa, a lot of them are covered in silk. So there's often silk on the outside, the pupa's inside. In the case of butterflies, they form a uh, pupa that's called a chrysalis that doesn't have any silk on the outside and just has kind of typically a shiny hardened surface. Sometimes it's actually even transparent and you can see the developing uh, butterfly inside. So those are just, just some general differences. And, and again, there are all kinds of exceptions. So now that I've given you uh, a few pointers, I'm going to quiz you now. So I think the next slide I have up here is a quiz. So here we go. Um, here's a beautiful Lepidopteran. Um, so the question here for you, bug, uh, Bama bug novices, is, is this a butterfly? So Allie, um, I don't know if you're monitoring the comments. I'll wait a few uh, yes, seconds to I'm see whether we, we have anyone that wants to comment on what do you think this is? And I'll, I'll wait maybe 30 seconds before I give you the reveal. All right. Oh, this is a great picture, though. Did you take this picture, John? I did not. This is, you can okay. thank Wikipedia for this one. Thanks, Wikipedia. Great picture. <laughs> All right, let me see. If anyone has any guesses on whether or not this is a butterfly or a moth, go ahead and drop them in the comments. Let's see which one this is. I think I have my guess. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you another hint. This one actually flies during the day as well. So. Ah, okay. I don't know I if that's going to help anyone's decision. I think I have a guess. I think I have a guess. All right. Well, let me know when you're no. when you want me to go forward, and I'll I'll reveal the answer. Are we going to reveal them later? Oh, I'll reveal it right now. I mean. Okay. I so, can I give you my guess, John? Sure. Go ahead. Is it a butterfly? Mm -hmm. What do What do you What does anyone else think? Any other comments? Are you the only one? Anybody that's else? I think I'm the only one right now. Right. If, if you guys think I'm right, go ahead and put butterfly. If you think I'm wrong, go ahead and put moth. <laughs> and again. Biology is crazy. So I, you know, I always tell people I, there's always rules, but then most things in biology, oh. rules are broken. I'm going to change my mind. There's fuzzies on it. I'm going to say moth. Okay. I, just so, now saw, I saw the fuzzies underneath. I'm going to say uh, moth. That, that's a really good observation, Allie. I'm going to. Um, fuzzies think, is a technical term. Yeah. Uh, scientific, it's, I'm sure. It's actually the scale. So <laughs> you're getting to a good point. The fact that, you know, <laughs> the scales in moths tend to be larger. Uh, whereas like the, that the photo I showed you earlier is a typical butterfly scale, just kind of very flat. Um, but the fuzz that we see in moths is, is a modified type of scale and they tend to be long and hair-like. So um, it's something I didn't didn't make clear, but you're actually, that's a really good observation, Allie. Okay. One vote for moth, two votes for moth, including mine. All right. Well, I'll go to the reveal. Well, you guessed right then. So this yeah. is a, this is actually well this Aaron, is not you and I were on the same page. Good not, job. Uh, a species we'll see here in North America. This is actually from comes from Madagascar, but it's a day flying moth. But it, I think if you show most people this, particularly if you didn't, if the picture was smaller where you couldn't see the little bit of fuzz, um, this has a lot of butterfly-like features. It, it has does. really bright colors. Um, it has really skinny antenna. They're not clubbed at the end, but you'd probably be hard to tell that they're they're kind of bushy like typical moth butterfly, moth antenna are. Yeah. Moths, I didn't, I didn't point out earlier, typically uh, male moths are even extremely bushy. So when you see a moth with a really, really bushy antenna, it's typically a moth. They use chemicals, pheromones, to find the females. Uh, so when you find a big moth with big bushy eyebrows or antenna, it's almost certainly a male moth looking for a female moth. But I thought this was just an incredible example of where uh, your average person would be fooled because this one really kind of, uh, sh it, it looks like a butterfly, acts like a butterfly, but uh, if you look at the details of it, it turns out to be a moth. So Tricky, tricky nature. Yeah. Did you see Sharon also notice the fuzzies? Thanks. Oh, great. We're on, we're on the same page. <laughs> all right. Well, that's, that's like I say. Sometimes, you know, I miss, I think I, if I just saw a quick picture of this out, I might mistake it. If I got to go to Madagascar I, and didn't know about this animal, I probably would mistake it for a moth. I mean, excuse me, a butterfly at first Butterfly, glance. if it just fluttered past you real quick. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. I mean, again, sometimes the behaviors, um, I, sometimes butterflies fly a little different. There are some other details, um, like how the wings are linked. Um, moths tend to have the, the wing, the hind wings and forewings attached to a little kind of hook-like process. So there are little details there, and sometimes that's revealed in their flight behavior as well. But uh, okay, I thought this was kind of a fun quiz. But uh, 
I want to show you about some local diversity. So in the main your talk, I kind of want to focus on if you're interested in learning more about these, uh, Alabama is a great place to be exposed to them. So our friends, the Abbots, John and Kendra Abbott uh, with UA Museums, the uh, Department of Research and Collections. They're also very talented photographers. Uh, they put together a little PDF. Well, it's not yet on our resource page, but it'll be on there uh, very soon. This little PDF you can download of some common moss species. So everything you see here and on the next slide are moths, not butterflies. And you'll see they vary a lot in shape, but there's some really colorful ones. You saw the regal moth earlier. There's also a big luna moth on there. Uh, there's a pink and yellow rosy maple moth. Um, so they're really diverse. And here's some more. Um, again, these are not the size. So some of these moths are quite big. Actually, that the one here, I showed you the regal moth that I talked about being the heaviest moth in, in North America. It's not the largest, though. The largest moth is actually the black witch. So at the bottom left-hand corner of this slide is an animal that, well, it doesn't weigh as much, has a much bigger wingspan. And again, um, there was one of these that was spotted um, last year by um, a friend of mine in Mooney Sokol Park here in Tuscaloosa. And uh, she spotted it. Uh, she was out looking for snakes and spotted this under a bridge. And I went back with an hour later and it was gone. So it's still on my wish list. I haven't seen this one here, but uh, if you see a really big uh, butterfly, it's most likely the black witch. And the thing's probably get maybe almost like maybe eight wing, eight inches in wingspan, I would say, a really big one. So the idea is that these are out now, while they're not all out right now, a lot of these are, and I saw some of these just last night. So the other reason I, I really like moths is I want to tell you about, or actually one more subject I mentioned, um, because someone will probably ask this question if they don't, is, you know, why moths are attracted to lights? Because um, this is a really fascinating question, because we'll actually use this to, if you're interested in attracting moths, to learn about them, you learn that you can improve your odds of seeing them by using light. So moths, as well as many other insects, nocturnal ones in particular, are attracted to UV, UV wavelengths of light. So this is the part of the spectrum that is, is just kind of a little bit far of purple light. And we generally can't see much of it, maybe a few wavelengths of it, but most lights put off a little bit of UV, um, even though we don't recognize it. But insects see that and they are attracted to it. So there's an attraction phenomena. And on top of that, moths and also some bugs as well, actually navigate uh, using a technique called transverse orientation. And they typically do this using moonlight. So moon reflect some of the sunlight that is reflected off the moon and what we call moonlight actually is in the UV spectrum. And that light, because it's, it's very relatively distant from where the moth is, they can actually, if they maintain a certain angle with their body as they're flying, they can navigate by that and basically fly in relatively straight lines. And this uh, transverse navigation works really well when your light source is really far away like the moon. But when your light source is relatively close, it doesn't. And you basically wind up, instead of moving in a straight line, go more in a, in, in a spiral. So that little figure in the image there, if you actually watch a moth coming into a light or some moths, you'll see them, they come in and they go round and round, often getting closer and closer. And in a flame, they can get so close they can actually be uh, injured by the flame. But that's what's happening. Uh, some moths just actually just settle and don't continue to fly once they get close, but some will continue to buzz around there. So that's the phenomenon. They're attracted to the UV light, and then they're also using it to navigate. So artificial lights kind of completely fool them. Um, Tens of millions of years of evolution led them to use the moon. And in, in the short time that humans have been using artificial lights, they haven't figured out yet uh, that it's not the moon. So that's that's what's actually going on there. And just kind of a few memes here. I love the idea that the moth, the distracted girlfriend meme of the moth being distracted from its girlfriend by an artificial light. And then I, I've had this experience where sometimes you get a big silk moth that appears at your window and uh, people are sometimes terrified them. But I like the idea of thinking they're just, nice fairies. These are big fluffy moths. They're not going to bite you. These ones don't even feed as adults. They don't, actually don't have a functional proboscis. So the reason I want to encourage you or tell you about that is right now we're in the middle of actually the first day of National Moth Week. So this is an international event that happens every year around the world in which we try to encourage people to observe the moths in their area. And this year, because of the COVID-19 outbreak, there aren't any public events. Uh, the museum has held public events in the past at Mountainville Archaeological Park, 
at the Warner Transportation Museum. Hopefully next year we can resume that. But you can actually do it in your own backyard, and I encourage people that want to be involved with it. Um, you can Google uh, National Moth Week to get information about um, how to do it. You can also go to iNaturalist. They have an iNaturalist project where you can take pictures and submit the moths that you see. In addition, we have a local Alabama project that I've created, which is just Alabama moths. So all the moths that I'm seeing at my house starting at last night, and I'm going to do it every night this week, I'll put out some black lights. I use a small um, compact fluorescent UV light that puts off some additional UV, and that draws in a lot of insects. So I was doing this last night, and do, we'll do it every night this week and submit my observations uh, so you can get a sense for it. So just last night, I haven't even uploaded all my observation, but these are actual moths I saw last night in my backyard in Tuscaloosa. Again, a lot of diversity. They're not all brown. Some of them are, but I've um, got some colorful ones. My big hit this was this one kind of almost like it's a wasp mimic looking moth. It's a clear wing moth called an Arkansas clear wing moth. And it has this little tuft of scales. It's got a little fuzzy butt that is kind of iridescent, but the wings themselves are kind of, kind of shaped like you might imagine a wasp. And it's kind of banded with yellow and black bands. So I think the idea is this is probably a predator avoidance mechanism. So this just gives you a small sample. I also had some, they're not shown here, but uh, some giant silk moths uh, as well. So I'm hopefully, you know, over the course of the week, um, for example, that yellow vested moth, that, I've been doing this now for about five years, um, not every night, but during the summers. And that was the first time I'd ever got this species at my house. And I think right now I'm closest to about 700 different species of moths that I've been able to record just at my house uh, by putting up a light at night. And I started just with a regular porch light. I mean, you can do it just with an exterior light, but if you have um, black lights, either fluorescent black lights, like the same things you use for fluorescent posters and paints, those work. Um, mercury vapor lamps, some street lights uh, also put off a lot of UV. And the more UV you have, um, the, the greater kind of a, attraction will be to these moths and other nighttime insects. So I encourage people, um, if they have any interest, like I said, you just have to turn on your light. And you you won't may, maybe not get a lot of light with a regular incandescent bulb, but you'll get some. Um, so the idea is that's where you can start. You don't need any fancy equipment, uh, but to get into it, uh, there are all kinds of resources. Um, there's a Peterson guide to moths of Southeastern US. I'm going to show you, uh, there's iNaturalist, obviously, that you can use and submit um, pictures. And it'll and the iNaturalist application will help you identify them, as will the community of iNaturalist users. There's also a really active Facebook group that John Morgan, my friend, runs, um, that they're actually having a contest. And whoever sees the most species is going to win um, a light set up and some other pieces of equipment. Uh, and it's a social thing to do. It's, it's just like bird watching. People moth watch. And it's the kind of thing you can literally do from your backyard. Um, and when we have our meetups, we often sit around. We sometimes relax, maybe have a drink. And it's kind of a social experience. And we wait and watch the moths. As moths come in and go out, we'll get up, we'll photograph them, um, maybe try to identify things together. And then it, it's just a social activity. So I really encourage people. It's a great way to get your kids involved because you literally can do it. All you need is a light you can turn on at night. You can do mothing through National Moth Week. Again, uh, just to put a quick plug in for the sticker giveaway, our, our art contest has ended. So um, we're going to start looking at the art that came in, but you can still submit any bug theme artwork through social media, memes, jokes, photos uh, through social media with the hashtag Bama Bug Fest. We still have some stickers to give away. And so just get that in before the 25th. So you've got one more week to submit that with the hashtag Bama Bug Fest. And like I said, I'll go through it and I'll pick out my favorites uh, to give away stickers. And with that, Allie, I'll answer any questions that have come in. All right. So let me see what we've got. It looks like we might not have any questions at the moment, but if you guys have any questions right now, please feel free to uh, drop them in the comments for Dr. Friel. Um, I personally learned a lot through this one. Um, I first, again, I feel like I said this all the time, but your meme game, John, your I'm meme just, game. I'm glad I, 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 I do that. Now that I know you like memes, Allie, it's kind of, I think a lot of my, my internal, Matt, Allie works with me at the museum. So I'm, I may have to communicate with you primarily through memes. <laughs> from this point. 
I, it's I a know. perfectly acceptable form of and communication. I, you know, it, it's so easy to generate your own ones. I mean, I, sometimes a few of these I've created myself, but the vast majority of them are really memes that already exist. Um, moth memes are incredibly popular. Uh, they really peaked in 2018. Uh, I've actually found several articles where people talk about this phenomena of moth memes um, that really took off. And, you know, there's the whole spectrum. Um, like the, actually the, the one I have here, this is a rosy maple moth. So this is a species that um, you can find right here in Alabama. And some people look, they think they look like, a, you know, they're cotton candy. They're hot <laughs> pink and yellow. And they really are almost fluorescent. Um, one that has just eclosed or emerged from its um, uh, pupil case or, uh, excuse me, chrysalis. Actually, in this case, it's a cocoon. It's a moth. Um, are, are just so bright, vibrant. And they'll kind of fade as the scales fall off, but all that fuzz are individual scales. But they're they're at, and this one is probably a male. I was talking about the antenna. You can see he's got these nice fuzzy antenna. So it's probably a boy, uh, rosy rosy maple moth that's you know using those antenna to basically pick up the pheromones that a female is putting off. So I, the, I think that's one of my favorite parts about um, insects in general and what we've learned through the rest of this Bama Bug Fest one, because in aquatic insects, it was, it was, we talked about that too, but a lot of times the males, when they reach adulthood, have these like, just like, you, like fuzzy antenna or these great, you oh. know, horn things yeah. on their heads or the males are always the one who like show out, you know, trying to find their little date. And I love that. Yeah. I mean, for, for most insects that the clock is ticking, as soon as they um, become adults, um, they have to find a mate ASAP. It's just like, they can't decide, you know, I'm going to put off finding a mate. I want to, you know, do something else. I have a hobby. It's like, and, and depending on the species, it can be as short as a few hours, a few days, a few weeks. Most, most insects don't survive more than a few weeks as an adult. And mm -hmm. there's wear and tear as they're doing this, they're avoiding predators. You will see, you know, in the case of moths, I can, I can look at a moth and say this, you know, you'll see some moths that are absolutely perfect. There's every scale on them. They just look like they, they're, they just came back from the hairdresser. Everything is perfectly coiffed. <laughs> and then you see other ones that have bald patches. Uh, they're missing bits of their wings where maybe a bird has tried to grab it. Um, they've escaped a predator. Um, so it's a tough life being an adult insect. Uh, but the idea is, you know, and they keep going and going. And then if they're lucky, they find that mate. But they, they're using everything, as I said, some of them are visual, but most of them are chemical. So it, you can often attract people that breed like giant silk moths. Um, they sometimes will raise a female and they'll put it in a little mesh container outside. And within minutes, they'll get dozens of males that'll come in. They're, they're just attracted. I mean, it, 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 it's all these chemicals that we can't perceive uh, that are all out there um, that are bringing in all these things. So it, you know, I always feel kind of like I'm going into an insect bar at night. It's just like that light is just like the bar is open. Um, the males get drawn in and they're hoping, well, maybe there's a female here too. And every, once while, night, every night. Every once in a while, if, you, if I do get a, it's usually male moths that come into light. In a lot of cases, female, there are actually some female moths that don't have wings. They just, they come out and they just crawl to a place and start emitting pheromones and just wait for the males to find them. They don't even fly about. It's typically the males that do the flying around. Uh, but every once in a while, I'll get a female moth, and, and sometimes you'll actually see, um, have males find it. There might be multiple males. I've found a female. Sometimes she'll lay eggs immediately after mating. Um, so oh. it's not uncommon sometimes to find, um, you know, insect or moth eggs. And, and I've, you know, if I know what they are, I can raise them sometimes. I've had um, lunar moth eggs. Like last year, we, we had some live lunar moths at Bama Bug Fest at the Transportation mm -hmm. Museum. They laid eggs while we had them out. I brought them home, they hatched out, and then I found a sweet gum tree, uh, which is one of the plants that they'll eat, much like Megan Pimsler was telling us about. Yeah. One of our program. I put all the, so hopefully some of them ate that leaf alone and survived, but um, it's, it's a tough world. I mean, a, a lot of birds eat caterpillars, a lot of other things, they get preyed on. So that's why you know, they lay so many eggs. Um, so it's really fascinating. You, we just get to see them during this really brief phase where they're just like, hey, get out of my way. I have to find, my, my, my mate, because I got to make some babies to carry on my genes. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know. I think that's one of the things that we don't think about um, when we're watching those insects out there, but they are working and they are <laughs> trying to 
Uh, uh, accomplish their goals very quickly. Yeah. Like I said, as, as caterpillars, it's all about eating. They just, they're eating machines and it's, that, and it's going in one end as fast as it can, getting much, as much nutrition and then pooping out the other end, all that frass. <laughs> and, and oh, they do, I love that word, frass. You know, it's like, if you imagine as a kid, all you did was eat and poop. And then when you became an adult, it's just like, you just had this shift. And then it was just like, I just have to have babies as soon as possible. I mean, it's, they kind of, they're, it's so separate. And that's why, you know, it's almost like they have two different lives and uh, they can be so different looking because they are specialized. A caterpillar, it's all about gaining energy and mass to make a big adult. I mean, the, right. the, so you, you know, the thing is you can see, and you'll actually observe this some, in the same species, you'll see little individuals, big individuals, and that simply reflects how much they energy they got as a caterpillar. So Oh. They are, are really good. It's a good year, and there's lots of their host plants. You get really big caterpillars, and, and the, a big caterpillar makes a big pupa, makes a big moth or butterfly, okay. vice versa. So I, I've seen some species where individuals will be twice the size. A big individual will be twice the size of a small individual, and that is just reflects the individual history of that caterpillar. So you know, it's it's just like you. you they don't grow once they you know. Um, become a pupa. So they're as big as they're going to get. They've got all the energy that's going to go in their eggs. When they feed as adults, it's all about energy for flight. They're not really putting energy they consume then into um, eggs and reproductive. Um, it's, it's just that flight behavior. And the thing they're doing, they're also pollinating. So that's the one thing I want to put a plug in there is that so many of these moths and butterflies pollinate things. Yeah. And many things are the only pollinators. Uh, of. And there are there are flowers in which that have really deep, you know, kind of tube-like flowers, and there's no butterflies that can reach them with the proboscis. But there are moths. I mean, Darwin discovered. I think there was a I forget what it was an orchid that was. Uh, I think it was an orchid. Yeah, I uh, think so. That he didn't know what pollinated what moth, but he predicted there would be a moth that pollinated that had an extremely long proboscis. And then long after his death, scientists discovered it, and sure enough, he was right. This moth has just an extremely long proboscis you know and you know, imagine having a tongue that's longer than your body that when you fed you could roll that thing out and then roll right. it back in uh, yeah that just is, is mind-boggling so again, it would be I, I, it would be helpful when i'm binge watching something and want a snack from the fridge you know <laughs> that's right so again I, you know, I find bugs and insects um just fascinating and there's just so many things about them if you you know they're not all icky. I mean, I think some of these butterflies are so good. That's why I think butterflies are a great way for people to get into them because there's many people that love butterflies, but any other insect, they will turn their nose up at. So, yeah. you know, for me, um, moths really opened my eyes to how to, I, you know, I've never really appreciated insects. Like I got interested in moths and now I'm interested in spiders and other groups of arthropods. But the idea is uh, they're everywhere and you, you know, it doesn't cost anything to get interested in them. And, uh, Hopefully, as a result of Bama Bug Fest, um, we'll get some people interested in learning about moths and other groups of insects and bugs. So that's that's kind of what our festival is all about. I think we have a pretty good chance of it because we've gotten some really great um, feedback, which is wonderful. And we've had some really great, um, just, I think, some hopefully some interesting content. So I, I think hopefully there's a chance that we'll have some more insect, insect friends after <laughs> next week. Um, okay, so right now it doesn't look like we have any questions, but if you watch this video later or if you're watching it now and think of a question later, feel free to drop it in the comments. We are um, monitoring comments throughout the day and we will have a chance to uh, talk to Dr. Friel again uh, during the daily wrap up today at seven and we can answer um, your questions there. Um, if you would like to ask him live, you can watch it at seven and put your question in the comments and we can ask him live. But um, just, you know, this was not the end of your question asking opportunity. There are several other opportunities from then or from now on. I got my email up there. So if people have questions, they can email me. Um, I'll try to make sure we get those uh, PDFs available because um, okay. that's a great start. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, there's a lot of online resources. Um, this is one of my favorite field guides, the Peterson guide for, and it's, well, it doesn't have every species. It's got a lot of them and, and it's just a great pocket guide. If you've got Peterson guides for birds and other groups of organisms, but this is a one they'd have for insects, which is quite useful and I recommend. Great, thank you. And there actually, I, there's also a Butterflies of Alabama book. Um, oh, right. yes, I have that one in my, do you have it nearby? Uh, one second, I gotta take okay, my- Okay, let note. me pull, yeah. 
So while he's looking for that one, um, you know, that resource guide that he's talking about, I want to make sure that everyone knows about it. Um, again, I know we've mentioned it a couple of times, there but that resource guide is, um, oh, hang on, let me take myself out. Okay. Yep. So this is a valve from UA Press and um, it, it, it's got nice big pictures. It's not really a field guide in the sense that um, the Peterson guide is, but it's an, a very nice coffee table book uh, that's specific to just Alabama. And there's a there's a great there's a butterflies of Alabama website that has really detailed you know the one thing about butterflies a lot of people like to attract them to their yard and um, you know if you want to attract butterflies or moth or picking moths you need to know what their host plants are and that website will actually tell you if you know if you want Gulf fritillaries um, you need to plant passion flowers so I've got that plant in my backyard because that will bring in um, those particular butterflies if you want monarchs you need to have milkweed. So that's the kind of thing that once you, you know, you might say, oh, I love this butterfly. Well, do a little bit of research, figure out what plant, and often they're native plants, um, and plant them in your yard. And if, if the plants are successful, you may will almost certainly eventually get caterpillars. And while the caterpillars, yes, they damage the plant, um, most plants can survive um, the damage. And you'll be rewarded with the butterflies that you, you know, maybe seen a picture in the book in your yard. Um, so that's my kind of kind of closing advice for people. It, it ties that's into great. things that you know Pam Sloan is talking about native plants, um, pollinators. So it's all tied together, and I think you know that's what I really like about this is uh, there's something for everybody. So. And I was just thinking too, talking about Pam Sloan. I was talking the she's a, a part of the Master Gardeners um, that's right. Association. That's. I, the association. I don't know if that's the correct term for the organization, but the Master Gardeners of, of it's, a, it's a program through uh, program. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and she's heavily involved in that. And they have, you know, if you're interested in finding out what plants attract butterflies, that might be a great place to look uh, to uh, start to research. But then also, I believe that there has been some talk about some of those on some Discovering Alabama episodes. So if you guys are interested right. in watching Discovering Alabama, you can find it at discoveringalabama.org. I will put that uh, link at the comments. Um, but they've got great videos that um, I believe some of them have covered um, pollinator, native pollinators. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Holly, do you know if I, I know our next segment is going to be iconography? So, you, they'll talk a little bit about um, the sphinx moths. So, that's a great yes. case because uh, that involves pollination of tobacco. So, I, I'm looking forward to that program with Dr. Jim Knight because I think. Me too. I'm excited about it. Um, and I think it's going to be great. You know, it's another way, you know, today, like we said, is dedicated to just moths and butterflies. Um, and so it'll be a great way. We've talked a lot about the biology and the nature aspect of it, but I really like that we're going to be able to bring in some of the historical context for how these, you know, creatures of these organisms have been a part of human lives for a really long time. So it'll be a lot of fun. I mean, it'll be good. Um, okay, well, I think that should wrap us up for today. Um, again, if you have any questions, make sure to drop them in the comments and we will monitor them throughout the day. Um, but I want to thank you all again for joining us for Bama Bug Fest on the web today. Um, make sure to check us out on uh, for the rest of the day today. We have the iconography um, event at four and then our daily wrap up at seven. But um, after that, on Tuesday, July 21st is our pollinators day where we'll talk, I'm sure we'll mention moths and butterflies. We'll come back into that one. Um, and content always appears at 10 to four with the daily wrap up at seven and uh, all times are central standard times. If you aren't able to join us for our live presentations at the times that they happen, you can always go back and watch them later through the archive videos on our social media sites, YouTube channels, and and our handy resource guide, which is what uh, Dr. Frill had been mentioning before. Um, make sure to uh, like and subscribe to all of our partner social media pages and channels. And for a full schedule of events, as always, or we can find it on the BamaBugFest.org website. Um, and as always, we want to thank our collaborating partners for making this event happen. And we want to thank Dr. Friel for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you spending some time and expertise with us. And um, just teaching us a little bit more about moths and butterflies. Thank you so much, Dr. Oh, Friel. It's been my pleasure. Um, so we appreciate all of you spending your time with us and um, hope that you can join us again for the four o'clock program. Wherever you're watching this video right now, you can watch the four o'clock program in the same place. Um, and I guess we'll just see you guys next time uh, for Bama Bug Fest on the web. Thanks everyone, have a nice day. Bye folks.